The Moore's Murderers, Ann Brady and Myra Henley. The Moore's Murderers, Ann Brady and Myra Henley's bizarre and deviant sexual relationship drove them to torture and murder defenseless children for pleasure in a case that appalled the world. When 19-year-old Myra Henley met Ian Brady in January 1961, he was already deeply disturbed. He was 21 years old and worked as a stock clerk at Millwards, a chemical company in Manchester, but his mind was full of sadistic fantasies. He had a collection of Nazi memorabilia and recordings of Nazi rallies. During his lunch hour, he read Mein Kampf and studied German grammar. He believed in the rightness of the Nazi cause and regretted only that he could not join in its sadistic excesses. Myra Henley had problems of her own. When she was 15, her boyfriend had died. She could not sleep for days afterward and eventually turned to the Catholic Church for consolation. She was known as a loner and a dame dreamer, although at school it was noted that she was tough, aggressive, and rather masculine, enjoying contact sports and judo but that hardly made her suited to working life in 1950s Britain. After a series of menial jobs, she became a typist at Millwards where she met Brady. He impressed her immediately. She considered most of the men she knew immature, but Brady was well-dressed and rode a motorcycle. Everything about him fascinated her. Ian wore a black shirt today and looked smashing. I love him, she confided to her diary. For nearly a year, Brady took no notice of her. The pig, he didn't even look at me today, she wrote more than once. Finally, in December 1961, he asked her out. Eureka, her diary says. Today we have our first date. We are going to the movies. The film was Judgment at Nuremberg. Soon Henley had surrendered her virginity to Brady. She was madly in love with him and was writing schoolgirlishly. I hope Ian and I love each other all our lives and get married and are happy we ever after. But their relationship was far more complex than that. Henley was Brady's love slave. He talked to her of sexual perversions and lent her books on Nazi atrocities. They took pornographic photographs of each other and kept them in a scrapbook. Some showed the wheels from a whip across her buttocks. Henley gave up babysitting and going to church. Within six months, Brady had moved in with Henley, who lived with her dog in her grandmother's house on the outskirts of Manchester. A frail woman, Henley's grandmother spent most of her time in bed, giving them the run of the place. Brady persuaded Henley to bleach her hair to tonic blonde and dressed her in leather skirts and high-heeled boots. He called her Myra Hess, or Hesse, after sadistic concentration camp guard Irma Grease. Henley became hard, and cruel, doing anything Brady asked. She did not even balk at procuring children for him to abuse, torture, and kill. The first victim was 16-year-old Pauline Reed, who disappeared on her way to a dance on July 12, 1963. Somehow, they managed to persuade her to walk up to the nearby Saddleworth Moor, an isolated windswept part of the Peak District National Park, where they killed and buried her in a shallow grave. Four months later, Henley rented a car and abducted 12-year-old John Kilbride. When she returned the car, it was covered in peaty mud from the moors. Brady and Henley laughed when they read about the massive police operation to find the missing boy. In May 1964, Henley bought a car of her own, a white minivan. The following month, 12-year-old Keith Bennett went missing. He too was buried on Saddleworth Moor. At Brady's behest, Henley joined a local gun club and bought pistols for them both. They would go up to the moors for practice. While they were there, they would visit the graves of their victims and photograph each other kneeling on them. On December 26, 1964, they abducted 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. This time, they were determined to hurt their defenseless victim as much as possible. They forced her to pose nude for pornographic photographs, then they tortured her, recording her screams before strangling her and burying her with the others on Saddleworth Moor. Even this did not satisfy the depraved Brady. He wanted to extend his evil empire. He aimed to recruit Myra's teenage brother-in-law, David Smith. Brady began to systematically corrupt Smith. 
He showed the youth his guns and talked to him about robbing a bank. He lent him books about the Marquis de Sade and got him to copy out quotations, murder is a hobby and a supreme pleasure. And people are like maggots, small, blind, worthless fish bait, Smith wrote in an exercise book under Brady's guidance. Brady believed he could lure anyone into his world of brutality and murder. He bragged to Smith about the murders he had already committed, saying he had photographs to prove it. They were drinking at the time and Smith thought Brady was joking. Brady decided to prove what he was saying and ensnare Smith into his vicious schemes by making him a party to murder. On October 6, 1965, Brady and Henley picked up 17-year-old homosexual Edward Evans in a pub in Manchester and took him home. Smith had been invited to visit around midnight. He was in the kitchen when he heard a cry from the next room. Then Henley called to Smith. Help him, Dave! Smith rushed into the living room to find Evans in a chair with Brady on top of him. Brady had an axe in his hands and was smashing it down onto the boy's head. He hit him again and again at least 14 times. That's it. It's the messiest, Brady said with some satisfaction. Usually it only takes one blow. He handed the axe to the dumbstruck Smith. This was a simple attempt to incriminate Smith by making him put his fingerprints on the murder weapon. Although Smith was terrified by what he had seen, he helped clean up the blood while Brady and Henley wrapped the body in a plastic sheet. The couple made jokes about the murder as they carried the corpse upstairs to a bedroom. Henley made a pot of tea and they all sat down. You should have seen the look on his face, said Henley, flushed with excitement as she started reminiscing about the previous murders. Smith could not believe all this was happening, but he realized that if he showed any sign of disgust or outrage, he would be their next victim. After a decent interval, he made his excuses and left. When he got back to his apartment, he was violently ill. He told his wife and she urged him to go to the police. Armed with a knife and a screwdriver, they went out to a phone booth at dawn and reported the murder. A police car picked up Smith and his wife and at the station, the terrified 17-year-old told his lurid story to unbelieving policemen. At 8.40 a.m., the police dropped by Henley's house to check Smith's story out. To their horror, they found Edward Evans' body battered in the back bedroom. Brady admitted killing Evans, but said it had happened during an argument and tried to implicate Smith. Henley only said, my story is the same as Ian's. Whatever he did, I did. The only time she showed any emotion was when she was told that her dog had died. You fucking murderers, she screamed at the police. The police found a detailed plan that Brady had drawn up for the removal from the house of all clues to Evan's murder. One of the items mentioned was curiously Henley's prayer book. When the police examined the prayer book, they had a left luggage ticket from Manchester Station stuck down the spine. At the luggage office, they found two suitcases that contained books on sexual perversion, weapons, and pictures of Leslie Ann Downey naked and gagged. There was also the tape of her screams, which was later played to the stunned courtroom at Chester Assizes. Other photographs showed Henley posing beside graves on Saddleworth Moor. These helped the police locate the bodies of Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride. At the trial, the true horrific sexual nature of the crimes was revealed. The pathologist disclosed that Edward Evans' fly had been undone and he had found dog hairs around Evans' anus. John Kilbride's body was found with his pants and underwear around his knees. Henley, it seemed, got turned on by watching Brady perform homosexual acts on his victims. Later, Brady let it slip that both he and Henley had been naked during the nude photograph sessions with Leslie Ann Downey, but otherwise they refused to talk. They were sentenced to life. Brady did not bother to appeal. Henley did, but her appeal was rejected. They were also refused permission to see each other, though they were allowed to write. Brady has shown no contrition in prison and has refused to be broken. He saw himself as a martyr in his own perverted cause. Gradually, he went insane. Henley eventually broke down and petitioned to be released. When that was refused, a guard, who was Henley's lesbian lover, organized an escape attempt. It failed and Henley was sentenced to an additional year in jail. She earned a college degree and gave additional information on the whereabouts of the victim's graves in a bid for mercy. 
but Brady countered her every move by revealing more of her involvement in the crimes. He saw any attempt on her part to go free as disloyalty. The weight of our crimes justifies permanent imprisonment, Brady told the parole board in 1982. I will not wish to be free in 1985 or even 2005. He got his wish. Though he made several attempts to starve himself, Brady was still incarcerated in 2005. Henley died in jail in 2002.